Okay, um, hello, dear friends. Uh, this is Sarah from Sunset Bell. What I'm going to be opening up today is the Game of Thrones tarot. You know, when this uh, initially came out, you know, I remember thinking, um, oh, you know, there's so many decks I want to get. Uh, I'm sure this is just a novelty deck. Um, it's, you know, it can't be all that good or well put together. It's probably not very well thought out. Um, and so I'm just not gonna get it. And then of course it came out and I started, you know, reading some reviews and things. And it only took me a couple of reviews of people saying, actually this deck is quite nice. It's high quality and it is quite well thought out. So I bought it um, and it has arrived. So I'm gonna go ahead and open it up um, again. I'm sure this is a totally unnecessary video for me to do. I'm, you know, everybody and their mother, you know, that entire sort of Venn diagram of Game of Thrones people and tarot people and everywhere that intersects has probably already done um, unboxing videos of this deck. But I'm gonna do one anyway because I like filming unboxings and walkthroughs and I like watching them even if I've watched other ones for the same deck already just because it's fun to hear people's different perspectives on the cards. So. And it's also nice for me to walk through it and um, just sort of, you know, talk myself through it the very first time I look at the cards, you know, to kind of help me um, really kind of solidify my feelings around how I feel about the cards and the first impressions that they give me. So I'm going to go ahead and open this up. As you can see, I got it from Amazon, and here it is, and oh my gosh, I already really like the box. It seems like a very nice, sturdy box, um, and uh, ooh, the packaging is really nice. Um, cool. So I'm going to go ahead and take the shrink wrap off of this. I, I've seen some reviews of this. Um, you know, like written reviews. And then I have also, um, I actually I have not watched a walkthrough video of this tarot or watched any other unboxing videos. Um, this is, you know, my first time seeing a lot of these cards. You know, I've seen pictures of several of them in reviews and stuff, but um, a lot of them are gonna be new to me. So I'm very excited to see how I relate to these and, um, you know, how they fit into my impressions based on my knowledge of the show so um, and of the tarot. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, open this, but gosh, this is super nice. This is all like raised, um, embossed print on the box. Um, these cards are, are like raised and embossed and then it's got this nice metallic on it. Oh, that's so nice. Oh my God, and look at this little guidebook. <gasps> I love it. I mean, obviously it's very tiny, so it's, you know, it's just a little white book, but um, really in size, but um, but it's really nice. You know, it's hardcover bound. It's got this sort of antique looking cover on it. So yeah, look at all the pages are printed in like a very antique -y sort of way. This is really nice, actually. And it looks like it comes with some spreads and, um, and the spreads are Game of Thrones themed. So this is like the Red Keep spread, spread the Old Gods of the North spread. Um, oh, the Faith of the Seven spread. So yeah, again, I drink and I know things. Ooh, I love this. I love this. And um, spread of the Maesters. Oh, like a Maesters chain. That's cool. Um, Okay, well, I'm not gonna like go through this because I don't wanna see the cards. It looks like for the majors, there's a couple paragraphs just describing the character, and then there's given an upright meaning and a reversed meaning, just sort of like one paragraph of meaning, um, but it does explain sort of the thinking uh, as far as, um, uh, as far as the, uh, the, the character or symbol from the show that was chosen. And then the minors just have, you know, a little bit less um, of an explanation of the characters, but it does give an upright meaning and a reversed meaning. So here is the deck and 
I'm already liking the Fool card. I'm going to talk about that more in just a second, but oh, it's nice. It feels pretty like it, through the shrink wrap. It's you can tell it's got a little bit of a of a linen kind of texture to it, sort of like a high quality playing card. And they're a nice size, you know, they're like a normal tarot deck size. Um, definitely shuffleable for me. Um, and then I love these Iron Throne backings too. Like those are just really cool. And I'm super excited. This is all hand-drawn art and it has a little bit of like a woodcut kind of look to it. Um, so it, it's a little old fashioned. The cards borders are there, but they look a little bit aged. So they really don't, um, they don't seem to detract at all. And okay, yeah, I mean, they definitely have a texture to them. They're not super thick. You know, they're pretty, um, they're pretty bendable, I'd say. Um, and you know, I'd say they're not super like springy bendable. I mean, like I think about like any Baba Studios decks, for example, like those cards aren't that thick, but they stay straight and flat. And if you shuffle them, if you bend them when you shuffle them, they like spring right back to the shape that they're supposed to be in. And these, you know, you can see it kind of holds the shape a little bit if I bend it just a little bit. So, you know, so that's, I mean, that's okay. I, I'm guessing I will read with this deck sometimes um, for fun. I, it's not gonna be like my main deck or anything like that, I'm sure, unless, you know, unless something really changes for me as I'm looking through the cards. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna just adjust my setup a little bit and zoom in a little bit on the cards um, and then just do kind of a walkthrough of the deck and talk a little bit about my initial impressions and yeah. So I'll be right back. Okay, so I am back, um, ready to take a look through this deck and just sort of talk about my reactions. I really have only seen some of the cards in this deck. I haven't looked through the whole thing yet. Um, so this is really gonna be kind of unfiltered reactions to the cards as they come up, just you know, based on what I know of tarot and what I know of Game of Thrones, um, just kind of f feeling out what my first impressions of them are. Um, you know, my initial first impression here is that I really do like this as the fool. Um, I, I really like, um, you know, that this shows Tyrion going down amongst the dragons, and that is a really huge moment. This is, I mean, it's one of my favorite moments in the entire series um, when he goes down and he speaks to the dragons, and it's really him um, starting that new adventure, you know, really becoming a part of Daenerys's court and understanding what it means that there are dragons back in the world again. And it's really him kind of taking that leap. He, he trusts that these terrifying animals aren't going to hurt him um, because he, he, he just has some knowledge inside of himself that is telling him that it's all going to be okay. And, um, and I just, I really, I really like this, you know, I really feel like this, um, encompasses the energy of the fool in a really cool way. So I like that a lot. Um, little finger is the magician. This is one of those things that makes a ton of sense, but it is a pretty dark interpretation of the magician. You know, it's, um, obviously little finger completely embodies that whole concept of the magician has skills to manifest what he wants in the world. And that, I mean, nothing could be more definitive of Littlefinger as a character, but there is that dark side of the magician that implies that you might be using some, um, you know, cunning or underhandedness to really, to, to get what you want. Um, you know, that you, you're, you're effective and you have these, these special skills and abilities, but, um, but you know, that there might be this sneaky, tricky, um, element to it of, you know, don't, uh, don't look behind the curtain using misdirection to to make something happen and obviously that's little finger to a T. So I do I do feel like it's a dark interpretation of the magician but it makes a lot of sense. So we got Melisandre here as the high, as the high priestess. And on the one hand I find that really interesting. I mean, I always think of the high priestess as being like there's always water in the card and then you have Melisandre here and it, she's all about fire, right? She's she serves the god of fire. Um, and it 
again, it's a little bit of a shadow interpretation of the high priestess because, you know, the high priestess is all about looking within. It's about that intuition, that inner knowledge. Um, and, you know, she really shows the side of that that might be deluding yourself because for a long time she really deludes herself into thinking that she knows what the right outcome is. You know, she knows initially that Stannis is going to be the king and it's her role to help him achieve that. And she's seen it in the flames and, and you know, she goes to all of these terrible ends to try to make that happen. And, and then she fails. And, you know, she's just been deluding herself the entire time into thinking that the, that inner vision that she has is actually real. And so, so again, you know, this is almost a reversed interpretation of the high priestess. And Daenerys is the empress. Um, and this is an, an interesting image of her as the empress. Um, you know, I, I like this. I mean, the other, the other image I might have of Daenerys for the empress would be that moment when, when, um, she emerges from the flame with, with dragons on her, you know, she's, she is reborn after, after being burned and, um, and the, the dragons are born. Um, but I, I really like this because it gives you not just a sense of that sort of, um, you know, life giving and child having energy of the Empress, which is part, part of the energy of the card. But, um, but you know, this is really her taking control of her own destiny as well, which, um, the Empress sometimes seems like a little bit of a passive energy, and this is very, very much the opposite of that. So I think that's kind of And cool. Jon Snow is the Emperor. Um, and, the, you know, you can see here he's wearing the Stark, the um, Stark insignia. So clearly this is the version of Jon Snow after he's become King of the North, and he's really taken the Stark name. And, um, you know, because for, for a lot of the, the show, he is kind of running away from the power that's embodied by the emperor. Um, you know, he doesn't he doesn't want that kind of power, and he accepts it unwillingly. Um, even you know, even when he gets power by becoming Lord Commander of the Night's Watch or be, by becoming King of the North, he he does accept that power unwillingly. Um, so it, it you know, so that that's interesting. But you know, he obviously has that inner sense of what's right, and he, I don't know. I mean, obviously, this is like a really positive. Um, positive de depiction of the emperor archetype like this is you know if the emperor was always like this I'd be like yeah excellent like <laughs> give me the emperor anytime um, I've seen some people criticizing this concept of Varys as the Hierophant um, I actually really like it and the reason is because I think again that this embodies a very positive interpretation of the Hierophant you know Varys is he's trying to restore tradition. I mean, he is trying to bring the Targaryen dynasty back to Westeros and he's trying to come, you know, he serves the realm as he says, and he's trying to bring the realm out of chaos and, um, you know, put it back on a path of, of, uh, of prosperity and justice. And, um, so, you know, so that to me, he, he's serving a particular tradition that in this case is going to be really good for society. And so I, I, I like that interpretation. Excuse me. He's also an advisor. So he's tr he tries to guide people on a path. And that, that is also a very um, positive interpretation of the Hierophant, I feel. So I, I really like this. I saw somewhere somebody mentioned like, oh, the the High Sparrow should be the Hierophant. And like, I didn't like that at all because again, that, that only gives you that negative meaning of the Hierophant, um, of, of rigidity and um, over piousness and, um, you know, th that whole thing that people struggle with about the Hierophant where I really think that the card can have so much more to it than that. And um, and I feel like Varys really captures that um, in, in, in a great way. So I really like that. Um, Jon Snow and Egret as the lovers, I, I, I like that. I mean, you know, they're, they're definitely the purest relationship in the show, and they're definitely both, um, they're both making a choice, you know, they're both, um, uh, struggling with conflicts from outside of the relationship that, that tries to pull it apart, but they're, but, but they still love each other. And, um, and so I, I really like that interpretation. There's no other couple in the show could, that could have been a really good lover's card. I feel like, um, uh, Drogon is the chariot. Yeah. I mean, obviously like <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, this is a, 
you know, this is one of those ones where it's like, yes, absolutely. This completely embodies the energy of that card. I love this. Brienne as strength. I mean, this is kind of ingenious because first of all, obviously, you know, she's holding Oathkeeper here. So, so there is a lion in the picture, which I love. Um, but then also, you know, this depicts her at a moment when she is trying to use that influence on on Jamie Lannister, who who is a lion, and she is she is showing him what it can mean to be honorable and what it can mean to know right from wrong and that sort of inner strength that she has to hold fast to a vow and to always do the right thing. And um, so I, I, I really just, I love this interpretation of strength and I love that use of the Lannister lion in the symbolism here. It all just, this card is just one of those ones that just like works and works. Like it's, it's, it's one of the, there's, it just kind of gives you some chills as far as how good the interpretation is here. I really like that. Bran is the hermit. I mean, this this works fine. Um, I feel like it would have been kind of a cool opportunity to use uh, use the three-eyed raven um, as the hermit, and that might have actually been kind of a cooler picture um, because Bran has, I don't know, and I, I suppose the hermit can have that connotation, right? Because, you know, the hermit is on a kind of a journey of discovery in a way. You know, he's got his lantern, and he's, he's trying to, um, you know, he... He, he's on that sort of path inward of, of learning. And so, you know, I think Bran works, but um, I think that the Three-Eyed Raven and how much more alone he's been for longer and how, you know, it's it's been an opportunity for him to become fully connected to and attuned to everything going on in the world around him, um, you know, despite being, being withdrawn, um, I think is it would be kind of a cool interpretation. I also feel like it would just be all the branches and stuff would be a cool image. The Wheel of Fortune, I mean, another completely, like, perfect use of imagery from the show um, in a tarot card. And it, it, this is just really cool. I mean, it's literally, like, a quote from the show. You know, the wheel goes around. First one family's on top, then another family's on top. And it, this particular one, you know, shows the Lannisters and the Targaryens on top and the Baratheons and the Starks on the bottom. And obviously that encompasses a lot of what's happening in the show. And then Littlefinger, the Mockingbird, just sitting outside of all of it and watching it happen and manipulating it. Um, I just, I think this is a really cool card. I mean, it just, it just, it just works. Um, Ned Stark is Justice, another one that really just, just solidly works, right? You know, I mean, the man who passes the sentence should swing the sword. There, there is no character in Game of Thrones who embodies justice to the same degree as Ned Stark, um, justice and goodness and, um, and, you know, knowing the right path and always trying to do the right thing. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I really like this. I do wish it would, it showed him with ice because I feel like, well, I can't tell what he's holding on to there. Um, but I, I, you know, I do wish that it showed, showed ice just because I feel like that weapon is sort of in, in some ways the embodiment of, uh, of Ned Stark's idea of justice and then when it that when it's used to execute him it's like the ultimate perversion of justice so it would have been a really fascinating symbol to put into this card and I, I kind of wish they had done that but I, I like the depiction it's a cool cool one this I can't say I'm a huge fan of um this feels kind of too easy this feels just sort of like it's based on a on a visual um, correspondence and not on a meaning correspondence. Um, you know, I mean, this is just a picture of a tortured person and obviously there is infinitely more to the hanged man than a tortured person. But this is great. Not only, I mean, not only does Arya become sort of an angel of death in these books, like literal death, but this shows her at, at her moment of complete transformation. When she has gone from being Arya Stark to trying to be no one, back to fully reclaiming herself and being happy to be who she is again. So she's gone through the most complete full cycle metamorphosis right at this point in the show. And that encompasses the death card really beautifully. So I, I love this one, actually. I think this is... This is great. Um, Sam Tarley as Temperance. Um, 
you know, I'm going to have to think about this a little bit more. I mean, it's, um, you know, I, I mean, it has sort of the gentle energy of, of temperance. I'm not sure I'm kind of putting together the, the connection between all of the meanings of temperance in terms of, you know, the, the concepts of, of, of balance and, and so on. But, um, you know, as an image, it, it, it feel it has that soothing quality that, that temperance does have. I, so I don't know. I might have to read the guidebook about this one and see what they were thinking with it. Cause it just doesn't, it doesn't initially scream temperance to me, I, but I, I mean, I love the image. I love Sam. Who, who doesn't love Sam? Everybody loves Sam. Um, Ramsey as the devil. This works on one level and doesn't work on another level. I mean, they really emphasize the chains and obviously, you know, obviously Ramsey is awful. Like he is a demonic, completely, he's a monster. I mean, he's completely uh, uh, devoid of any kind of human redeeming qualities. Um, but what this really leaves out is the element of choice that goes along in the devil. You know, so, I mean... Well, well, I mean, I guess if you start to think about Reek, then that, you know, Reek ultimately becomes Theon keeping himself prisoner, really. Um, it's, you know, it's Ramsay breaking him to the point that he no longer has a sense of self and, and is just kept prisoner by, by his own will. Um, so... I, okay, I guess I can see that. I guess that makes sense. Um, I guess it, it's kind of a shame that they didn't actually have Theon in the image um, because, you know, so much of the devil is about the fact that the devil is in you. You know, the devil is what you subject yourself to. Um, the devil is what you choose. And um, so having just Ramsay in the picture, it, um, I don't know. I think if Theon had been in the picture that, interpretation would be clear but anyway so it it works but maybe I just don't love the image I guess is where I'm going with it um this is actually a perfect tower uh, because this you know this is the tower that Bran falls from after he sees Jamie and Cersei together at the very end of the first episode. I mean the shock that happens here is one of the precipitating events that really triggers all of the chaos of the remainder of the, the series is, is Bran's fall from this tower. And so I actually think that this is a really superb choice for the tower. Um, and it just is lucky that because it's, because Game of Thrones is magical that way, that it's also, you know, from a visual standpoint, perfect imagery. And I love this as the star as well. This is Sansa. Um, when she puts the candle in the window to lead Brienne to her to rescue her when she's being held captive after she's been forcibly married to Ramsay and is how oh, and enduring horrible things um which is a storyline that I still am struggling with um years later um but but like but this is actually beautiful for the star because it encapsulates that hope it encapsulates that guidance um you know of, of leading Brienne to her um that's a that's a really nice choice for the star the moon door for the moon. There's that sort of obvious connotation to it, but I am not sure that there's anything beyond that. So I'm not sure that I like this one very much. Um, I, I, I do love that, you know, that sort of swirling um, armillary sphere um, being the sun with, with um, is that baby Drogon? Yes. And their sunflowers. I really like this as the sun, um, because yeah, you know this this sphere again. It's good visually, but it also implies that sort of light of illumination. You know, I always I, I love the opening credits of Game of Thrones because it's you know this big map with the sphere swirling over it, and it just it really implies that somebody is like looking down and seeing the full truth of everything that's happening on this map, you know, and understanding all of the full inner workings, you know, as, as all of those different buildings and stuff like grow up out of the ground and sort of are like little clockwork buildings um, with the sun floating over it. And it just, it implies that somebody is studying all of, 
everything that's going on and they're seeing the full truth of everything. They're seeing how everything's inner gears and cogs work and um, and are, have just that full visibility into everything that's happening. And um, and I really like that. And then, you know, having Drogon here and the sunflowers gives it that sense of, of joy and happiness. And um, so, so I really like this a lot. That's a, that's a nice choice. You know, this is another one where, I mean, on the one hand, it's, you know, it's kind of obvious, like the nice king like raises all these zombies, right? So it's, it's got that visual connotation of, of what judgment looks like, like in the Rider Waite Smith, for example. Um, I can see how this would work as a judgment card as well, potentially from Jon Snow's perspective, because he is watching all of this happen and it is a moment of complete revelation to him, you know, that he finally understands fully what they're facing and what his purpose is. That when he sees this is the turning point for him when he knows what he needs to be fighting for the rest of the series. So from that perspective, it works as judgment as well, but it kind of makes me wish, you know, again, that maybe the perspective was flipped and you could see like the Night's King here and Jon Snow here to give you that kind of perspective of that the transformation isn't just um, these dead people coming back to life. It's it's a, a transformation that's happening inside Jon too when he actually sees this happen um, because I think that gives it the full the full meaning of judgment as opposed to just a kind of a visual cue of looking like judgment. And then, yeah, Westeros as the world. Um, you know, and I mean, it, it, it does make sense too in that, again, it's a little bit more of a, of a shadow interpretation potentially because you have all of the different families around and like, this is what they're all fighting each other for. And so obviously possession of this is what, to each of those groups represents, you know, fulfillment and completion and, um, and attainment of, of, of the highest thing that they can imagine. But, but it's kind of like also, ugh, you know, I mean, is this really, this is really not the most important thing in life, um, is, is power over a piece of land. Um, so, so again, I like it. And, but again, it does have a little bit of a darker meaning, but because this is Game of Thrones, like, is it really shocking that things have a darker meaning? Not so much. And, ooh, yeah. So the lovely Martell sigil here as the Ace of, Sphere, of Spears um, for the fire suit. I mean, I'm sure that that is um, Sun Spear off in the distance there. Um, that makes perfect sense. Lovely two of, of Spears. Um, again, perfect for the fire suit. We've got the dragons and Daenerys and, um, you know, and she is looking out at all her worlds to conquer. And I mean, that's a perfect two of spears right there. And then the three of spears, you know, in this case, yeah, it's, it's, it's little finger, um, watching, watching the ship's approach. And that makes perfect sense as a three of spears. Um, and the four of spears, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's like a wedding, looks like a wedding celebration of some kind in, in, uh, in the red keep, um, in the gardens. And yeah, I mean that, that works, you know, it's not super specific to any particular event in the show, but it works. And the five of spears, um, I like this, um, you know, this shows the unsullied, uh, in Marine, um, it looks like they're just kind of sparring because, I mean, these are all unsullied. They're not actually fighting anybody. They're just kind of sparring amongst themselves. So that does kind of give that conflict for conflict's sake sort of interpretation of the Five of Spears that, that you often get. Um, so, yeah. So that works. And then, oh, here is Daenerys after she takes Astapor. And, um, yeah, that's that's a perfect Six of Spears it's really kind of amazing when you start to think about it, how many of these Game of Thrones scenes like embody a tarot image, like right down to the elemental symbolism, you know? I mean, it's, that's pretty amazing. That's pretty amazing. I love that. Uh, and here is Grey Worm being assailed by Sons of the Harpy in the Seven of Spears. Again, that is really cool. That is really cool, and and again, it's in in the book, it's or in the show, it is actual spears. Um, that is really neat. 
Okay, and so here is the Eight of Spears. So now we're back to Martell Spears here because this is the scene where, um, uh, this is where, you know, um, the Sand Snakes first appear and um, we discover that uh, they are out on, you know, the Sand Snakes and Ilaria Sand are out on a mission of vengeance um, against the Lannisters for having killed Oberyn. And um, so, so yeah, I mean, obviously there is some big, uh, big news, big action, sort of big stuff coming people's way that they don't necessarily know about yet. And, um, and then of course this, you know, the spear looks like Obara Sand's uh, spear. So it, that, that works. She totally like spears somebody through the head in this scene. I mean, it works. Oh, and the nine of spears. So yeah, that here is, um, Jon Snow's army holding off the Bolton army when they in the battle for Winterfell as they all close in around him. Um, you know, that's interesting it, because oftentimes the Nine of Spears is implying a little bit more of a pause in the action. And this is very much kind of the midst of the battle. Um, but uh, from a visual standpoint, it works and, and, I, and I do like it. And it looks like what we have here is just a random guy carrying lances um, that are going to be used in, in the in a tournament. Um, and so, you know, again, it's not depicting any major character in the book or anything like that, but it does imply that, like this worker and it's, you know, we're not seeing <laughs> like obviously a noble is not going to be hauling these spears. It's just a reminder that there's these people in this world who are the ones who get ground under the wheel and they're the ones doing all the hard work, frankly. Um, so that's kind of cool. And then I'm assuming this must be Grey Worm um, as the page of spears. And I really like that. Um, I like him as a page because, you know, his world grows so much in the show. You know, he is learning so much about... Um, how to go from an unsullied to being a human and how to love and how to, you know, live through what's been done to him once he finally starts realizing how, the true meaning of it. And um, so, you know, I like, I like him as a page. He's on a real journey of, of discovery from, you know, escaping this situation in which he's basically... Um, been programmed to be a certain thing and rediscovering his humanity. And um, so I like him as a page. And Jamie does make sense as the Knight of Spears. Um, I almost kind of wish that this was actually a picture of in the most um, recent season when he charges down Drogon, you know, he, or, he, or he, he, he's, he is in that battle, the, um, the, the loot train battle and, um, decides that he's going to take the chance and picks up a spear to go after Daenerys and Drogon is right there. And, um, that would have symbolized, I feel like the recklessness really well of the Knight of, of Spears, um, as opposed to this scene where he, this is just where he's on the steps of the, um, of the, uh, the sept, um, so I would have liked that scene to be to, to be the depiction instead. And there's also more fire in it. I don't know. It would have worked really well. But, um, you know, I think he's a good Knight of Spears. I think he's a good choice as a character. And then Daenerys as the Queen of Spears. And, yeah, I mean, that is a wonderful choice. She is a bold, fierce woman who knows her mind and isn't afraid of anything, really, and, and has that inner conviction, um, about, you know, what her destiny is. And, um, and that's a very nice queen of spears. Um, it's in, this is an interesting moment in which to depict her. I mean, I can see, you know, obviously this means that there's a spear in the, in the picture, but you know, this depicts her at a moment where she's considering compromising, you know, this is the moment where, you know, there, she's reopening the fighting pits of Marine right before she gets attacked by the Sons of the Harpy, who do throw a spear at her. So there's also that spear element as well. But but this is the moment when she considers compromising. Um, of course, 
from this moment, she's forced into a situation where she can't compromise, and that's when she rides the dragon for the first time and all that kind of stuff. But um, So it's an interesting choice of a moment for her. I feel like there might have been better moments um, to draw, but she is a perfect queen of spears. Okay, what? Okay, this is my very first, like, WTF to a card. There is nothing King of Spears about Ned Stark. He is the opposite. I mean, this is a weird, this is a very weird choice. I don't, I do not understand this choice at all. Um, yeah, I mean, Ned is, <laughs> Ned is, He's not warm. He's kind of a cold person. He's emotionally closed off. He's not fire. He's ice. Um, and he's he's not he's not bold. He's careful. So this looks like um, the wedding cup um, at Joffrey and Marjorie's wedding. I'm assuming is what is going on here. I don't remember this being what the cup looked like, but I'm pretty sure that's what's going on here. Um, you know, again, it works visually. It's an odd choice for the Ace of Cups because, like, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't really have that Ace of Cups energy. Like, what actually happens at this wedding is, like, horrible death and awfulness. And so it doesn't, you know, like, Joffrey and Marjorie aren't really embarking on a real relationship when they drink out of this cup, right? Like, it's, I mean, it's, it's the whole wedding is a farce and it ends in death. So, you know, as a visual symbol, it works. As a story symbol, not so much. But, I mean, it is a cool, it is a cool picture. Um, but I do like this for the Two of Cups. This is just, this is just the wedding vows under the Faith of the Seven. Um, so that's a nice choice for the Two of Cups. I like that. And this... Three of Cups. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure this is the picture of um, Tyrion when he's drinking with Grey Worm and Miss Sandy and tries to like get them to like tell stories and make jokes and have a fun time. And um, and so yeah, I really I, I really like that as the Three of Cups. Um. So yeah, Four of Cups. So again, this is a little bit of a dark interpretation because like whatever little finger's offering here, you don't want Sansa to take it. I mean, that's just, no. It works, but it doesn't have that implication of, you know, you're being closed off to something, to some new emotion that might be good for you. Um, here she's being closed off to something and you're like, yeah, girl, keep keep doing that. Don't Don't change that. So I don't know. That's, I don't know. It's okay. So the five of cups. So yeah, this is Cersei. Oh, because those are definitely her wine goblets. Oh, this is great. Because, I mean, and, the, and her hair is short. So this would be Cersei after she's lost everything. I mean, and you got the three spilled cups, like for her three children that have died. Oh, that's excellent. I mean, just symbolically speaking, it again, it's a little bit dark because like, you know, in the in the Five of Cups, you always have the two still full cups to imply that um, there is still something to live for in the world. Um, you know, Cersei in the show, like the only thing she really has left to live for after all of her children are gone is just the grasp of power for herself. Or, or boozing it up. So, I mean, so it's it's hard to say what goodness is symbolized by these two cups that are still full. Um, but, you know, just this initial, like, oh, my God, that's Cersei, and oh, my God, there's three spilled cups, and oh, my God, that makes so much sense. Um, from, that, from that standpoint, I really like it. Oh, this is so perfect. Okay, this is one of those ones that's so good it like gave me some chills when I first looked at it because this is, again, one of my favorite moments from the show. And this is when Sansa finally returns to Winterfell and she and Jon, literally, they have a beer together and they talk about their childhood. 
And so it's all about that nostalgia and reminiscence and feeling of family and finding family again and um and you know being in their being in their home together again like when they were children and so that's a beautiful six of cups and again that's such a perfect example of it not only being the perfect moment but in the scene from the show literally having the elemental symbol that we need to make it work for tarot um and the seven of cups you know brand having vision it does work for the seven of cups i mean you know it's brand seeing all of the possibilities of the future um so it, it doesn't have quite the same day, daydream symbolism that the Seven of Cups can have just because obviously Bran sees real stuff. You know, he's, he's a three-eyed raven. He, he sees stuff um, that's going to ha actually happen. But, um, but you know, it's still, it works. It's cool. Oh, and the Eight of Cups here. This is, um, I think what this is, is John when he walks away from the Night's Watch after he's brought back to life. Um, and yeah, that works really well as Native Cups. Um, that works really well. And Sam is the Nine of Cups. You know, again, that works. I mean, here he is. He's in a library. He's in a happy place. He is surrounded by this abundance of all of the things that make his life good. And he literally like looks like the man <laughs> in the Rider Waite Smith Nine of Cups. I mean, this you know this definitely works. And the Ten of Cups. This looks like like a bedroom in Winterfell because there's like the furs. I'm not entirely sure what this is, but I mean it. If maybe I'm totally misinterpreting it. I'm not sure. I'm not I'm not entirely sure what that is. I'm gonna have to look in the book for that one. There are a lot of brand cards. It's not one of those ones that like gives you goosebumps and makes you think, oh, this is so right. Like it's fine. It'd work. The Knight of Cups. So we've got we've got the Knight of Flowers. So we've got Loras Tyrell here as the Knight of Cups. And that really works well, actually. That that the romanticism of it. I mean him in his beautiful armor and you know how <laughs> how he's sort of like the, you know, the the Lancelot figure <laughs> almost in the show and and how he, ha you know, he does have this secret relationship and he's driven so much by his um, his love for Renly in the show and, um, you know, how, I, I, yeah, I like him as an Eight of Cups. And I like Sansa as, as the Queen of Cups. Um, you know, that does that does work from a character standpoint. Jon Snow is a King of Cups. Um, I like how there's, you know, he is, to he is ice from the Song of Ice and Fire in this picture. There's snow falling all around him. So there is that water element to all the Starks really because they represent ice in the show. But I'm glad that the deck wasn't so lazy that it just based, it just went off of that, you know, and just said, oh, okay, um, all of the Starks will be cups and all of the um, Lannisters will be coins and all of the Targaryens will be wands and, you know, and so on. Um, it, I'm, I'm really glad that it didn't go that route because it could have. And that's one of the things that I felt like, I feel like would have made this deck just kind of a lazy novelty deck. But they really did actually give a lot of thought to a lot of these cards beyond just sort of the obvious like elemental symbolism or the obvious visual symbolism. Um, you know, a lot of them just really ring true to the show and what the characters are trying to accomplish in the show. And I do feel like John has a really strong Knight of Cups or excuse me, King of Cups energy. I mean, he, he is a leader, but he's a reluctant one. Um, he is, you know, powerfully motivated by by emotions, but not in such a way that they're uncontrollable. Um, you know, he's very honorable, um, but but he also can can violate his his honor sometimes. I mean, sometimes love is more important to him than his honor. Um, so, you know, I I really like him as the King of Cups. I think that's a very nice a very nice choice for the King of Cups. Um, so we got Long Claw here for the Ace of Swords. And the wall. 
Um, this is a nice two of swords though, because you know, not only, I mean, instead of wearing a, a blindfold, this is literally a moment where Arya is blind. It's literally a moment where she's defending herself. And this is a moment where she, you know, needle represents being one person. And then the training sword for the house of black and white represents being another person. So there is that feeling of trapped there is that feeling of, of trapped and, and blind. There is that feeling of needing to defend herself. And there is that feeling of having two different paths ahead of her that she can choose between and, and always being tempted to walk away from the one that she's chosen. So um, that's, that's a really good two of swords, actually. Um, three of swords. This also feels a little bit lazy, although, um, you know, they have made the heart, the, the flaming heart of, um, of the Lord of Light, um, which, I mean, fine, you know, like, at least it made it a little more Game of Thronesy visually, but I get so bored with Three of Swords cards, honestly. Um, the Four of Swords, this looks like, you know, John Aaron, when he died, being attended to by one of the, the Silent Sisters. Um, this gives a much stronger sort of, um, you know, implication of death than the Four of Swords often has. I mean, a lot of times in the, you know, because the Four of Swords, it, it implies repose. It doesn't necessarily imply death. I know in the traditional Rider White Smith imagery, it does depict a tomb, but, you know, it, 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 you know, for in a lot of ways, is sort of supposed to symbolize a, a, a bit of a time out from life, a bit of time to contemplate things and to sort of go inward and, and, and think about, uh, uh, think about things. And, but this is just straight up a dead person. Um, so, you know, it's okay, but I feel like, I feel like it's just not that exciting of a, of a choice there. Um, this is a very good five of swords because this is depicting the moment when, um, when Theon takes Winterfell. And again, like, they're all there this is the second card now where I'm like I wish Theon had been in this card because I feel like the meaning of the card is really relevant to Theon as a character but it doesn't show him you know I mean this the, the that whole sort of energy of the five of swords that's very much about okay you've won here but at what cost you know there's been a conflict but has there actually been a good outcome um would be very much strengthened by actually having Theon in the card so, um, so I, I, yeah, I wish, I wish he was in it. And the six of swords, this is a lovely six of swords. This is when Arya first gets to Bravos, and that guy, um, rows her to the dock from the ship. Um, and so, you know, so this really does encapsulate in addition, again, to being visually correct for the for the card, um, it really encapsulates her leaving her old life behind and striking out on a new path. And I love all of the swords and the water sticking in the water because it's just, you know, it's a reminder of how she almost, almost completely abandons her whole life, her old life and throws needle in the water. Um, so this is a really nice choice for the Six of Swords. I like that a lot. Um, and the Seven of Swords here, again, the, I really you like... Know, I like I like Seven of Swords cards that depict the action in a little bit more neutral way, that give you a little bit more opportunity for interpretation because there are times when you steal something and it's actually the right thing to do. You know, there are times if you when you lie or do something a little bit underhanded, but it's actually the right thing to do. And in this case, you know, this is Sam stealing back his father's uh, his father's sword, Heartsbane, and which like what a crappy name for a sword right but um but regardless um this shows sam stealing back the sword which a you know he really should be entitled to because he is the eldest in the family and b he knows he needs it because it's made of um, valyrian steel which they know can kill white walkers so taking the sword is 100 percent the right thing to do in this in this scenario um again he's stealing it you know it's not it, it's not his um, he's stealing it from his dad, but it's the right thing to do. And so I, I like this um, Seven of Swords because it gives you that more ambiguity in the interpretation rather than just, you know, snide looking person sneaking away with swords. Okay. 
the Eight of Swords, and this is Brienne. And this looks like when she is being held captive, when she and Jamie are both um, taken prisoner together. When was that? Back in season three? Um, so, I mean, that wor you know, that works. Um, it, it, it works okay. It, it doesn't set my world on fire. Um, you know, I feel like Brienne is much more a prisoner of her own self in a lot of ways. And she's a prisoner of her own honor. And she's a prisoner of um, her own just you know, total stubbornness in, in doing what she believes is right. Um, and, and she's also a prisoner of sort of her own feeling of inferior, inferiority sometimes. Um, so I feel like there would have been more to work with here than just being like, oh yeah, one time Bri Brienne was literally held prisoner. Um, but you know, I, I can read all those other interpretations into it too. So that's cool. Oh God, this just bums me out. Um, so the Nine of Swords is the Red Wedding and it's Grey Wind knowing what's about to happen. And I don't even want to look at that anymore because it just makes me too sad. Oh, and then our other like most traumatic moment of the entire series when Jon Snow is murdered and literally stabbed in the back by all of his, um, his Night's Watchmen. Um, yeah, I mean, that's... That's about as ten of swords as you can get. Again, it blows my mind kind of how many, how many um, images from Game of Thrones are both symbolically perfect for tarot, um, but also literally from a visual image standpoint resonant with with like a Rider Waite Smith tarot deck. That's kind of amazing. So, a son of the harpy as the page of swords. I mean, I feel like this would have made a better knight of swords, um, frankly, than page of swords. This really doesn't work for me. This really doesn't work for me. Because, you know, I mean, the knight of swords, at the very least, like, you know, he still has to have that air energy that's about, like, logic and intellect and, uh, you know, Ramsey is just evil chaos and there's nothing like completely chaotic about the knight of swords you know the knight of swords um ha is actually has a thought process to what he's doing he he probably believes in it too strongly he probably pursues it too too violently potentially or with too much um you know, too much inattention to, to the effect it's having on other people, but there's still an idea behind all of it. Ramsey has no ideas. He just likes to watch people in pain. Um, so I, I really don't like this at all. This makes no sense to me at all. Um, you know, and again, this works, but again, it's a dark interpretation of the Queen of Swords. I mean, you know, this depicts Cersei at the moment that she has fully detached from emotion. You know, when she gets herself crowned queen, all of her children have died and she and Jamie are, you know, are no longer, um, you know, they're at a point where they don't trust each other anymore um, and he doesn't trust her and he's afraid of her and she sort of knows that. And, um, and so it, this is a point where she has just completely cut herself off from her own humanity. And so there's that coldness, there's that logic, that rigor and discipline. But, you know, I've, I always, I mean, the Queen of Swords hasn't lost her whole heart. And in this one, Cersei has. So it, so again, it, it works, but it's dark. It's definitely dark. Um, and the King of Swords as the Night King. Another one. I don't think this works for me. I'm just, you know, again, it's it's that implication of to to be in this the swords suit in the court of of swords. You you have to be completely detached from your humanity, and you know, I'm like going through all of these, and yeah, the. Aside from the Cersei, which sort of works, the swords courts just don't do it for me at all. 
So, and I think this is the coin that Jack and Hagar gives Arya to get her to Bravos. So that symbolizes like a new journey, which is cool. Lannister always pays his debts. Oh, that's, that's interesting as the two of coins. The three of coins here is the sept that um, is being built um, when the, you know, by the hound. Um, so, and, and in this moment too, you know, he is learning a lot from that, um, Septon Ray, um, who is, who is building the, he's building the Sept with, you know, he, he's, he's getting a lot of enlightenment about a better way to live that's not violence. Um, and so, so there is that connotation of just of hard work and building something, but there is also that connotations of apprenticeship and learning something, even though it's not even about the work that you're doing. It's about, um, it's just about how to be a better person in the world. This looks like the Iron Bank of Bravos for the Four of Coins. So yeah, I mean, that's pretty on the nose. Um, Arya out in the cold begging um, for the Five of Coins. Um, I don't know, this doesn't really do it for me because, you know, in a normal Five of Coins, there isn't necessarily that implication that people, are, like here she's just being tested, right? Like she's being put in this situation on purpose by somebody to test her. And she's not actually really in any danger. Like she's not genuinely poor here, really. I mean, she's she's being kind of artificially put in this situation to be forced to learn something. Um, and I feel like there's plenty of poor people in Westeros. Like I think, for example, about um, the farmer and child who the hounds take their money from, and the you know, and the um, the farmer says, you know, we'll starve come winter. And then in the most recent season, they found they find that um, that house again in the bodies. Um, though, but I mean, those characters would have made really good five of coins. I feel like um, so. I feel like there's other things that could have been done here. Um, that would have avoided this sort of like artificial situation that Arya is in. And the six of coins. Um, so this is Varys giving money to that woman who um, gets all met, freaked out because she thinks Tyrion is telling her that he wants to eat her baby. Um, and that, I mean, I, actually Varys in this card does work because, you know, Varys is very much about... There's that fairness in the Six of Coins. I mean, he, his whole goal is working to achieve justice and end poverty and make the world a better place. Um, and so, you know, this whole concept of him, like, doling out resources to the deserving and um, and trying to be fair, it does work. And then, you know, this is a, this moment is a pretty good image for it. So... Um, so yeah, I guess I can see that. Seven of Coins looks like just a rando gardener in the, uh, in the, um, Red Keep. I mean, okay, sure. It's fine. It, it doesn't let my world on fire, but it's okay. Eight of Coins. So obviously I want this to be Gendry. It doesn't look like him because like the hair is wrong, but let's just say it's Gendry. I'm just gonna say it's Gendry doing his blacksmithing and we'll call it good. This is an interesting nine of coins because um, it, it does it definitely shows the shadow side of the nine of coins. You know, um, Daenerys has worked hard. She, this is her and Karth, right, in season two. So, and she has worked hard to get here. She has brought her whole little tiny calisar across the desert, across the wasteland, um, and, you know, and, and she's come to this beautiful city that's lush and seems so very welcoming. But then this entire city is just, it's rotten at its core. There's this dark underbelly. Her dragons get stolen. Those warlocks, like, try to mess with her and then like try to kill her later like there's so much darkness that, that is going on in this city and so so again it's you know it's not just that beautiful nine of coins that you get in um in the in a lot of cards it's it's very much got that shadow meaning of um you know the garden that you're in isn't a good place for you to be actually um and uh so that's interesting and the Ten of Coins just looks like a very lovely feast. Um, 
So that works fine. So this is interesting. So this is Tyrion as the Page of Coins, but this is definitely Tyrion more at the beginning of the series, um, before he has really come into his own, and when he's still afflicted with so much self-loathing, and um, you know, before, like in season two, when he becomes um, master of, or when he becomes a, the king's hand, and then takes over the defense of the city and all of that kind of stuff. So, so this depicts him at a moment when he is still learning um, how many how many skills he has and how much he can contribute to the world. So um, that works that works pretty well as a page of coins. Brienne as the Knight of Coins, um, this also works because, um, you know, she definitely has the the diligence, the down to, I mean, the woman's the Terminator, right? Like, she never stops going after her goal. She is completely stubborn in her pursuit of it. Um, so, um, I mean, it makes her a very good Knight of Coins, actually. All of those sort of pig-headed <laughs> qualities of the Knight of Coins, she really has. And, you know, I mean, this this definitely works. Like, it works on the level of, you know, she's a Tyrell, and so she has a lot of money. You think of her as a little bit more of, like, the Queen of Swords, you know. Um, they, they call her the Queen of Thorns, not the Queen of Roses, right? Like, um, you know, she, there's a little more sharpness to her than a Queen of Coins. She's not a particularly nurturing figure, um, and she definitely is, um, somebody who's highly strategic, and so I see her as just a little bit more of a, of a Queen of Swords kind of character. Um, and then, you know, Littlefinger as the King of Coins, again, like, I don't know, it would be a dark side of the King of Coins, somebody who's maybe a little bit, um, too focused on the material, and greedy and kind of grasping I mean um you know again this feels like like this one feels easy that they make her queen of coins because she's a Tyrell this one it feels easy that they make him king of coins because he was master of coin but it doesn't really actually fit the characters all that well I feel so so that was long I went through the entire deck um on the whole I really like a, a lot of the deck you know, there were some cards where the interpretation was so perfect that it like gave me goosebumps. It just fits so well. And then there were other cards, especially in some of the courts where I was sort of like, nah, this is not right. Um, this, you know, this seems a little bit lazy. This seems a little bit based on the, the visual correspondence and not so much the actual, um, the actual meaning of the card. Um, so you know, so it, it had its good and it's bad, but on the whole, I think, I think from an artistic standpoint, it's a very beautiful deck. And, um, and I really liked a lot of the cards and some of the ones where I'm sort of like, eh, I don't know about this. I mean, I'll, t I'll take a look in the guidebook and see what they have to say about it because maybe they'll remind me of something that I forgot from the show and I'll be like, oh yeah, now that makes perfect sense. But, um, having not looked at it yet, you know, I, I'm just sort of going off of my initial impressions and trying to decide whether they make instant sense to me or not. And some of them don't, but, um, I am going to just give these a quick shuffle just to see how they go. Whoops. And, uh, you know, again, they're a nice size, um, for a tarot card. They're just like a totally normal tarot card size. They shuffle quite nicely. Um, so again, you know, my worry with these that I was talking about earlier is that they uh, they do have that kind of quality where once you bend them, they kind of stay bent a little bit. So I don't know. We'll see how they go. But like I said, I'm you know, I don't think I'm probably going to read with these like tons and tons. Um, I will probably read with them sometimes for fun or if I'm reading for a friend that's like a super big Game of Thrones fan and I feel like that would be fun for us to do that. Um, it's definitely not going to become like a workhorse deck or anything like that, but I, I do think it's really cool. Um, and honestly, I feel like it, they did a lovely job with it. Like the packaging is beautiful. The cards, uh, the illustrations are really nice. They're well drawn. They look good. Um, the cardstock has that nice linen texture. This little guidebook is like so cool and adorable. Um, so I feel like there's a lot that they did right here and, um, 
you know, it's a really nice set. And given that I'm just a massive Game of Thrones fan, it, you know, knowing how nice this is, there's, I have zero regrets about buying it. I think it's just, I think it's a really wonderful set. I think there's a few cards that leave something to be desired, but on the whole, I think they did a really nice job with it. So, um, so that's it. Thank you so much for, um, watching this, uh, entire, uh, Game of Thrones unboxing and deck walkthrough. It's been very long and, um, yeah, thanks so much. Bye-bye.